All right, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm here with uh, Manisha Jitani, Commissioner of Public Health, Fran Rabinowitz, um, uh, Superintendents of Schools, Charlene Russell Tucker, our Commissioner of Education, and Dr. Matthew Conway, uh, overseas uh, superintendents as well. I just want to give you my sense of where we are close to two years into COVID, uh, close to two years with uh, some of the executive powers that we've had that are going to be coming to a close on February 15th uh, as per a mutual agreement with the legislature, you know, going back uh, sometime. Um, it was close to two years ago that we got hit. We got hit hard. Uh, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut hit hardest. Um, we had to work fast and work to, thankfully, um, with uh, the authority given me by the legislature to get some things done to keep us safe. And um, what that meant in terms of making decisions um, on the run, I think it's kept us safe. Um, uh, obviously, a lot of what we did was already happening when it came to schools, when it came to restaurants, when it came to closing some of the things down, given the heat we were feeling from the early days of COVID. Um, most of those uh, facilities had already closed. We wanted to um, you know, make sure that was clear. Uh, unlike our neighbors, by the way, we kept manufacturing, we kept um, our construction, we kept our parks, we kept our beaches open because we thought that was really important to do everything we could to maintain a certain level of normalcy and do everything we can to get our economy going again. You know, it was, uh, you know, late spring, you know, right when we're still right in the worst of the pandemic that we started up our reopening committee led by public health. Dr. Albert Coe, led by business like Inger Nui, doing everything we can to plan about how we could reopen. And uh, you know, now it is a, a year and a half uh, since that time. Uh, I made an enormous priority of getting our schools open. I thought there was nothing more important in terms of the well-being of our kids and what that meant for our kids and what that meant for mom and dad being able to get back to school. So a year ago, September, we are one of the first states in the country to have our schools open with masks. Uh, there was no vaccine at that point. There was uh, no other way for people to uh, do it safely. We had some uh, infections out there, but our schools opened, opened safely, open for in-person learning and uh, what an extraordinary difference that made for them. And then just this last September, um, we were open again. And while a lot of our neighboring, some states further south, for example, uh, open without any masks, um, they were constantly opening and closing with uh, you know, lots of uh, quarantine and isolation, which we were able to avoid because we had the uh, mask uh, requirement in place. And that also gave our teachers the confidence that they could um, teach safely in the school, gave our educators that confidence that they could be at the school taking care of our kids. So now here we are in early February, our legislature is about to get together, there's gonna to be hearings, um, I think starting tomorrow. And uh, I think we're in a very different place than we were um, uh, six months ago, certainly a very different place than we were a year ago. The biggest difference I can tell you is the fact that we now have the tools to keep ourselves safe. Uh, you know, back then, if, um, Typhoid Mary or COVID Ken walked into a store. Uh, they had to be, um, you know, masked because uh, they could put themselves at risk and they could put everybody else around them at risk. I think today with boosters, given vaccines, given the N95 masks, um, you are in a better position to keep yourself safe. Your child is in a better position to keep him or herself safe. So that's why you know, working with um, uh, Manisha and Charlene, and working with my fellow governors, um, and I've worked very closely with New Jersey, they made an announcement of today, working with New York, working with Massachusetts, working with Rhode Island, that um, my recommendation is that we end the statewide mask mandate as of February 28th. In particular, what that means is the protocols for masks to be worn in schools and, and uh, child care centers as of the 28th, no longer be uh, by uh, mask, no longer by order of the uh, state of Connecticut. It will be up to you. It will be up to Matthew Conway. It will be up to superintendents of schools and mayors to make that election themselves. Because every town is different. Every town has a certain um, different um, sense of what the vaccinations is, what the risks are there. And I think you now know enough after two years to be able to make an informed decision yourself. 
I think this is something we've earned, Connecticut. We've earned it because uh, we've done it right. We're more likely to wear the mask, more likely to get tested, more likely to get vaccinated, uh, and uh, and we're now more likely to get boosted. And because of that, we have a vast, um, you know, 90 plus percent of our folks have had some level of immunity. That makes an enormous difference for our schools. That makes an enormous difference for our broader community. And that's why I think now is the time for us to say statewide mass mandate is no longer uh, at our level. Each and every mayor, each and every superintendent can make that call for themselves. I recommend the date February 28th. Um, with that, I know there'll be a number of questions, but um, Manisha, why don't you follow on from a public health point of view, if you would. Thank you very much, Governor. So, you know, as the governor said, we are in a very different place now than we were two years ago. We have so many tools at our disposal in order to protect ourselves and our communities with the number one thing being vaccination. We know that respiratory viruses circulate most during the winter time. And what we've seen with this Omicron wave is that we had a very rapid uptick and now we are seeing a much more rapid downtick than what we've seen with any previous variant that we've had so far to date. What we know is that our case counts are dropping, our percent positivity is dropping, although what that means today is different than it meant a year ago. We have self-tests that are ongoing at home. We also know that vaccines are really good at keeping you out of the hospital and prevent you from dying. However, we have had some breakthrough cases. So that also adds to the percent positivity. If you have a mild case of COVID, even though you've been boosted, that adds to the positivity number, but that's not the same number in terms of severity of disease in our population. Our hospitalizations are coming down. We're not where we need to be just yet, but they are coming down and they're coming down a lot faster than they were in the past because we have a milder variant Although our numbers reached almost the levels they were in April of 2020, we are coming down much more rapidly than we ever did before. Vaccinations, again, are our number, way, number one way for people to stay safe. And what we know now is that different communities have different rates. And so therefore, putting this decision at the local level where school boards can assess their population and decide with their community with their other leaders in their community, what works best for them is something that we are going to be allowing local districts to be making those decisions for those in their community. We expect that our numbers will continue to go down. We still know that masking is an effective way to keep kids in school, but now schools will have that opportunity to decide for themselves what works best for their community at the local level. And with that, I will turn it over to Commissioner Russell Tucker. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Governor. And you know, throughout this pandemic, we have had one goal in mind, as the Governor mentioned, keeping our, our students and our school staff safe and keeping our schools open. What has become more evident to us now through the pandemic and where we are today is that students learn better when they have access to in-person instruction access to a variety of supports provided in schools. We see this in our assessment scores. We hear it from our school staff who work with students every day, as well as parents. And we also hear this from our students themselves. So schools also provide much more, much needed structure and socialization with peers and all the other supports uh, that I know you've heard me talk about in the past. So this is why we've put so much emphasis on the mitigation strategies that you heard Commissioner Jatani uh, talked about, masking, we talked about vaccinations, uh, the testing that's necessary, social distancing, and all the other mitigation measure measures that have kept our schools open uh, and continue to provide us uh, what we need to make sure our students and staff uh, are able to maintain in-person learning. So currently, as you heard uh, from Commissioner Jatani and the governor, I think this is a good place for us to look at moving past the one size fits all. And we go back to what I know the governor mentioned as this off ramp for some of these mitigation strategies. The department in consultation with public health 
and all our partners uh, will continue to work very hard to issue the guidance we need to reflect the changes. We encourage our school leaders and uh, two of them are on today and our local health officials to continue to do the really great work that you're doing together, working together with the goal of keeping our students in the classroom and our school staff doing what they do best, which is teaching and supporting our students. So we are hopeful that this is the next step towards the normalcy that we're all really working so hard to get back to for our students. And I must say thanks to, I know Fran is here and Dr. Conway, because we've worked very hard together to provide the needed supports for our districts so critical in this time to make sure that we can all be working together uh, to keep our students safe and our students uh, and our, and our uh, school staff also working uh, in safe uh, conditions. So with that, I turn this over to Fran. Good afternoon and, and thank you. Um, I wanna begin by saying I am very proud to be in education in Connecticut. I think we have done an amazing job during um, the pandemic and I am very grateful for the leadership of the governor and the Department of Public Health and the Department of Education. Thankfully, we have um, really worked incredibly hard to bring all the children in um, to school because we know that is most effective. And I have to say our educators have been incredibly um, uh, persistent in that. And right now I want to say that I'm an educator and I believe in what the Department of Public Health has put forward all through this pandemic as a direction for us to follow. And if they feel that we are at a place now where we can move to a, um, a different path, um, I'm fine with that. I'm an educator and we will, we will move um, with our Department of Health and thank um, the governor and the Department of Health for providing that direction. Over to you, Dr. Conway. Mute. Dr. Conway, you're on mute. Dr. Dr. Conway, on mute, please. We're here uh, today in partnership uh, with the governor and his staff, with Commissioner Juhani and the Department of Public Health, with Commissioner Russell Tucker, with the Department of Education, to help ensure that the off-ramp that we're creating has the proper guardrails, the right distancing, the right signage and information so that all of us, as superintendents, for our amazing, amazing teachers, our incredible students and families, are confident going off this ramp that we know what direction we're going in at the bottom of it. Uh, and I am just confident in the leadership that the Department of Public Health has provided up until this time, that together we will be able to provide that guidance to our parents, to our staff, in a way that they're confident moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Conway. We'll now take questions starting with News 8. Hello, this is Bob Wilson with News 8. Wondering for Dr. Jutani, are you giving any guidance? Are there numbers that have to be met thresholds? So many vaccines, so much percentage of COVID? So Bob, thanks for that question. I think, you know, some of my comments in the beginning were to reflect that many of the metrics people have been used to following throughout this pandemic may not mean the same things today as they did earlier in the pandemic. Percent positivity means something different than it did when we were only doing PCR tests. There are 4.5 million self-tests that the state has provided in addition to other tests that people can buy over the counter right now. In addition, we know that hospitalizations are a very reliable number that we can follow. That's a hard number that we can follow in terms of what's happening in our communities. And I can tell you right now with over 600 people in the hospital still, 
I'm concerned that we still have a lot of hospitalizations. In another month, I'm hoping we continue to come down in terms of by the end of February. Every community is going to be different because vaccination rates differ so much by community to community. So what we will be doing is we will be giving guidance to say these are the various different things that you can do and you need to look at your community to figure out what's going to work best for you. We have communities that they have 90 plus percent of their students vaccinated and almost 100 percent of their educators and staff vaccinated in a school building. That's a very different calculation than if you've got 20 or 30 percent of your students vaccinated and maybe still your educators are still over 90 percent. And that's where we will give guidance as to what decision points different districts and boards can make that's going to work for their schools. The other point I'd like to make is that the closer and closer we get to warmer weather, to the longer days, to times when people can open windows, to allow less respiratory viruses, including flu, let me tell you, which we also do have a small amount right now in our community, but once the masks come off, we could have more. We do usually see flu go through March as well, that it's going to be up to local communities now. You can certainly continue to mask if you decide in your community that that is what works best for you. However, if you choose not to, that is what we're allowing you to do by removing the statewide mandate, as the governor has said. So we will certainly be giving guidance to help people navigate those tough decisions, but there's not gonna be one firm metric that I can give you that it is based on that alone that you decide what you're gonna do for your community. And luckily every school district has medical advisors, local health officials who we help provide guidance to as well to help operationalize the guidance that we provide. Hey Bob, I would add to uh, Manisha's excellence. The other variable to me is uh, the nature of the variant. Uh, for example, uh, it's tough to say, here's an absolute number, north of 5%, put on your mask, south of 5%, don't worry about the mask, we're at 4.8% today. Uh, I would tell you that if it was Delta, which is um, a lot more virulent, I'd be probably stricter in terms of uh, the infection rate. When it's Omicron, which is so much less virulent, you have uh, many more people who have a certain immunity, uh, I would have a, you know, probably an easier uh, metric to hit. So. It's tough to have an absolute number there. Channel three, Eyewitness News. Governor, I just wanted to clarify, you mentioned the date of February 28th. Uh, would that require legislative action? And have you had conversations with the legislature about what they want to see happen with the mask mandate? Uh, yeah, Mike, um, we, we've... We had a lot of executive orders. Now we're down to 11. Those 11, as I said, as regards giving us a little bit of flexibility when it comes to purchasing, when it comes to allowing, um, you know, some uh, retired teachers or nurses to uh, help out in, in a pinch. Uh, and, and it does include uh, the mask mandate. And um, if they um, let those 11 EOs, including the mask one, go through, what that says is uh, subject to Commissioner of Education and Public Health we would have uh, the discretion to um, you know, make the change we're talking about, which is ending the mass mandate schools and our um, daycare facilities. So would that give you the discretion to keep this in place beyond February 28th if something changed with the metrics between now and then? Yeah, Mike, if, if you know, Zombicron comes along and it spikes up as fast as uh, its uh, sister Omicron did, we would reserve the right to make a change in order to keep you safe. Uh, and that's one more reason why I think we're waiting another, you know, two and a half weeks. We'll have two more weeks of window. And by the way, we want to do it after the winter break. We wanted um, all the kids um, coming back, getting a fresh start. We're going to make sure we have um, rapid tests available for all the educators and all the kids, anybody that wants it, so they can come back to school safely. Box 61. Hi there. Um, is there a chance, uh, you kind of just touched on it, but a chance that you would reverse this, Governor? I mean, if it were to ramp up again, if there was a certain amount of community spread once again? Yeah, I do this um, in association with the legislature, which is uh, in session for the next uh, 100 days or whatever it is. Yes. 
will this change any other COVID guidelines in school in terms of maybe like quarantining? If, if there's no one is wearing masks in the classroom, does that mean the whole class has to now quarantine if one person were to get COVID? How is that going to be handled? I'll start and then has, has it right over to public health. But uh, we're giving a lot of discretion to our principals and our superintendents. Uh, and Manisha, I sure was going to give some pretty strong guidance on ways that they can keep people safe. Manisha? Yes, we will be issuing guidance that people and schools can use for max mask optional schools where you choose to go without masks so that it's more clear on what to do. To be clear, all the guidance that we have so far has been predicated on masks being present in schools. My hope is that we will have a decreasing prevalence of disease because overall, what we have to remember is all of the mitigation strategies that we have, you ramp them up or you ramp them down based on the amount of disease you have in your community. And what I'm hoping for is that we will have less disease in the community and we will have less occurrence of that in the community and in schools, but we will absolutely be providing guidance to help schools navigate what to do when they do have cases. NBC Connecticut. Hello, Governor. Uh, Hartford Healthcare this morning had a briefing. Uh, Dr. Wu spoke about it, uh, about masks in schools. And his personal opinion was that he would prefer that something like this would be pushed off until at least mid-March because that's typically when respiratory uh, diseases or viruses uh, start to wane. Was there consideration to push this off a little bit further than February 28th? Yeah, there's always consideration. Put it off another month, put it off to the end of the school year. Um, uh, look, the infection rate has dropped dramatically you know, uh, by a factor of five or six in the last um, you know, few weeks. Uh, does that give me comfort that we're headed in the right direction? Yes. Does that also mean it couldn't change uh, with another variant coming along? Then we got to be able to change with it. Thank you. News 12, Connecticut. So if there is a, a new variant or a new wave, would you be looking for the localities to reinstate mask mandates or would that be something that the state would take over again? I'll start with that, then let the knowledgeable people jump in. If I saw that there was a variant that looked like there was a possibility for real community spread, that something had happened in Pomfret can also impact uh, other parts of the um, state in a big way, the same way we had a year and a half ago, then you do something on a statewide basis. I don't see that right now. I think uh, we've got the ability to control the infections, control the spread, and most importantly, you have the ability to keep yourself safe. Anything to add to that? Maybe I'll say a couple of things, Governor. First of all, I think the people in the state of Connecticut should know that the governor has led us through two years of this pandemic using good judgment on when to institute things at a statewide level and when to pull back and allow those decisions to be made more at the local level. So if something is so severe where that needs to be dictated, I'm sure he'll use his judgment on that. In the meantime, what I would let people know, and to the question even about whether masks should stay on till the mid-March, for example, every community will have the opportunity to decide if they think that that is the better thing to do. We know that respiratory viruses transmit, and if a community decides that they want to keep it in place for a few more weeks, that's up to them. They will have that opportunity to weigh in on that, but they won't be required by us at this point. And I think that what I'm hopeful is that the numbers will continue to go down and we will be able to make these decisions safely as we continue to make our way through this pandemic. WTIC 1080. I know winter sports championships for the high schools start this week. Is there any interest or possibility of doing a carve out for school athletes who have been anxious to get rid of the masks so they can play without them? Hey, Paul, I see you're there with a lot of football helmets behind you. Why don't you speak up? Oh, thanks, Governor. Uh, no, we're, we're going to keep the 
as the governor and the commissioners have stated, uh, the statewide school uh, mask mandate uh, will, will cease on February 28th and that will be inclusive of, of sports as well. And officially from the 16th to the 28th, is that on the governor's authority or do lawmakers have to approve that section of the mask mandate? So the way that is happening right now, the current order the governor has in place uh, provides the authority to DPH and uh, the State Department of Education to provide uh, what's the overall order when it comes to uh, mask in schools. What the legislature would do will keep the fact that the, they will be uh, the entity that will make that decision, but on the 28th, uh, as stated earlier by the commissioners and the governor, uh, that they will uh, cease the, that mask mandate uh, in our school settings on the 28th. Connecticut Public. Connecticut Public Media. Associated Hi, yes. Press. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, no, nothing from me. Thank you. Associated Press. Uh, thank you. Uh, Governor, how much of this has to do with this growing sense that we're going to be living with this virus for a long time? I think that's a really good question, Susan. I think a lot of it does. Uh, this is not going to, it's not going to be, it's over, um, VE day, we're done. That's not the way it's going to work. If you saw 1918 and others, they're going to be increasing ripples. And what we got to figure out is how we as a society and we as a state learn to live with um, COVID, which hopefully has a diminishing impact upon our state and community for a long time to come. And I think we got the tools to do it. We got the tools to keep ourselves safe. We got the tools to keep our schools safe. And that's part of living with it. And do we still have, I, I pardon me for not remembering this, do we still have a mask mandate in place elsewhere, like on public transportation, things like that? Is that going to be affected by what you're recommending? Uh, there, there are mask mandates in, for example, public transportation. That's under federal authority, like on an airplane or something. So. Um, that will keep in place subject to federal rules. So there aren't any other state mass mandates after this that would be imposed statewide? Um, Health and Human Services continues to require the mass nursing homes. Do I have that right, Manisha? Uh, yes, so there are a few other areas. So for example, in homeless shelters and corrections, in healthcare facilities that uh, mask mandates still will exist. I'm, I'm sorry, just to clarify, that's, that's all federal stuff or that's all a federal mandate or is that state? Those are currently within the state mandate. Okay, so you guys would need that continued by the legislature. That is correct. Okay, great, thank you. First Connecticut Media. Hey, Governor. Um, I just wanted to see, could you explain how will this uh, work for students too young to be vaccinated or uh, uh, students whose parents haven't gotten them vaccinated? Is there any change there? Yeah, that's mainly, um, you know, daycare, childcare. Look, I'm sort of hopeful that um, you're going to see the Pfizer uh, vaccine for the youngest uh, being okayed over the next few weeks, but it's not okayed now. And uh, that's why uh, my hunch is Manisha will suggest to those who uh, operate daycare uh, where uh, the young ones are not uh, vaccinated, um, they may want to wear that mask a little bit longer. That'll be at their discretion, but I think that would probably be the guidance coming out of public health. So just to clarify, though, there's no, um, there, there won't be a uh, mandate that continues for those uh, individuals. Correct. Okay, and then uh, the other one had was there was some reporting that members of the legislature were saying uh, DPH and state DOE should make decisions on masking. Um, how do you how do you respond to that? I don't make any decisions without uh, Manisha and Charlene, so you can uh, count on that. And uh, we've discussed this um, amongst ourselves at great length. Yeah. And and I'll also add, uh, it's great that the legislature is in agreement with the governor's current order in place, having the State Department of Education and DPH be the, the leading uh, entities uh, in making these decisions in coordination with the governor. 
Um, towns with local mandates in, in effect, will that um, affect this at all? So, you know, uh, for towns that still have a, a town-wide man ma mass mandate, for example. That's at their discretion. CT Mayor. CT Mayor. No question for me. CT News Junkie. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, can I ask why the state won't leave this decision up to parents? Um, I'll start with this. Um, I think very strongly that um, uh, local control is, is key, especially when it comes to schools. I can tell you that there are a fair number of uh, schools where um, you know teachers may not feel as comfortable coming in unless they keep that uh, mask mandate a little bit longer. And I think that... Um, you know, Fran Rabinowitz and Dr. Conway, they're in the best position to judge what's the best way to keep the school open safely, teachers, educators, and students there. And can I also ask, um, what data do you have on in-school transmission of COVID? Manisha, do you have any current on that? Well, we've had the benefit in Connecticut of being masked for two years. Uh, what we do know is that when the school year started in areas that did not have masks and there was high transmission with the Delta variant that we saw at schools that did have to close because when there were no masks, there was transmission, especially when you have high disease prevalence. One thing that we're gonna have to get used to is getting used to the idea of ramping up and ramping down the various tools and interventions that we have that can prevent spread of disease. And if transmission and overall rates of this virus are down, overall, a community can decide that it is a time when masks are likely less necessary, especially if you have a highly vaccinated population. So we know from anecdotal experience and what we've seen even in published data around the country of transmission that has occurred. But again, it depends a lot on the amount of disease that is in the community and on the vaccination rate you have of your population. So there's no state-based, Connecticut school-based um, transmission data? No, because first of all, it would be all related to uh, masked settings. What we were able to see is that in masked settings, we had low transmission, which is why we first moved to screen and stay. And then in January, when the kids came back to school, we moved to a model where we did not even suggest that you had to do contact tracing within the walls of the school. And so we have progressively moved in a direction away from what we started with. And we've come a long way to be able to do that now. And Christine, I'll add anecdotally that we heard a lot from superintendents who were closely tracking uh, their close contacts when they were making close contact connections uh, that those students who were being quarantined as close contacts were not becoming positive. So while we don't have the, the data around that, that was what we were hearing anecdotally from a lot of our superintendents. Hartford Current. Hi. Um, first of all, on the subject of mask mandates, um, at one point, uh, masks were required in indoor settings for unvaccinated people. I, I, did, I, did I miss when that was repealed, or is that still in place, or what is the status of that? That's going to be at the discretion of the municipality. What about as of today? Uh, as of today, it's under the existing uh, executive order, as I understand it, where unvaccinated people still have to wear a mask indoors. Got it. So that one is still in place. Um, also, uh, in like the most technical sense, um, who once uh, the governor's executive uh, powers um, expire and assuming the legislature um, extends the 11 orders, who gets to make this call um, in the most technical sense? Who, who has that authority? Paul, do you have that? Isn't it the discretion of the public health and uh, commissioner of education? You are correct, governor. It's, that'll be reflective as it is in our, our current order. Uh, the legislature uh, will be looking to cons uh, consider, obviously, we're not going to prejudge any actions by them, uh, considering keeping that in place, and that will allow for uh, the, the two commissioners uh, to be able to make uh, that decision as the governor stated today. Got it. Thank you.
Thank you, guys. Waterbury. Okay, thanks. Um, so I just want to recap here because there's been a lot of questions and many answers. So you are going to ask the legislature to extend the current authorization for the Commissioner of Education and the Commissioner of Early Childhood in consultation with the Department of Public Health to set COVID-19 safety protocols, include wearing masks to February 28th. And after that date, that's gonna expire and it's gonna be local discretion. Uh, that's essentially right. Um, you know, if there was another emergency that came along with a son of Omicron, we'd take a second look, but I don't foresee that happening. And are there any metrics that you have in mind that would lead you to decide that we have to reverse course or as the Dr. Chitani said, ramp up again? Uh, hospitalizations, uh, percentage of infection rate, uh, broad activity. community spread with uh, something that's as virulent as Delta was, perhaps as evidenced by a greatly increasing uh, hospitalizations. Okay. And what would you say to school boards? Uh, do you think, well, actually, what do you think school boards are willing to take on this responsibility? Part of the issue that we heard in the, in the past was, uh, you know, perhaps local business owners and local officials uh, didn't want to assume responsibility for uh, putting in um, various restrictions and rather preferred a, a statewide approach. So do you think uh, local governments are ready to uh, step up and make these calls? Uh... Look, I do. I think we've been working through this together for a couple of years, but maybe perhaps Dr. Conway would like to, uh, you know, speak to uh, Paul Hughes's question. Do you think the superintendents and the boards of ed are ready to make these calls? You know, we, uh, all along we've had to make modifications and with each of those modifications has come guidance from the Department of Public Health, from the State Department of Education along the way to give uh, superintendents, boards of education, um, information to at least base those modifications on uh, and to move forward with. I think we have two and a half weeks to discuss this with our communities uh, as we get additional guidance from the Department of Public Health uh, in having those discussions. Uh, so I'm confident in that period of time that boards of ed and superintendents and most importantly our, our staff, students and families um, will have time to have the discourse and, and the conversations moving forward. And I wanted to uh, go back to uh, Sue Haig's question. In terms of public transit, will masks still be required if you're riding on a Connecticut transit bus? And for how long? I believe the answer to that is yes, Manisha. Uh, and that may be subject to some federal rules as well, do you know? Yeah, so my understanding is that from federal Department of Transportation rules, those types of public transportation would fall under masking rules. Okay, and uh, doctor, how, how comfortable you are with the, the, the current rate of uh, vaccine uptake and, and booster uptake? Uh, do you think it's, uh, we're at a place where uh, a move like this uh, that you guys are contemplating is uh, justified? So I think that our state is diverse. I think there are areas of the state that have really done everything they can do as maximally as possible to get vaccinated and get boosted. And there are people who are all along that spectrum and other areas of the state that really have not been at the same level. But overall, as a state, we are one of the most vaccinated and boosted states. So as a population, we are in a much better place than many other states in the country. But I do think I want to reiterate to people mm -hmm that we're at a point where we do need some personal responsibility when it comes to knowing how to live with this virus. If you know that you are vulnerable, if you think that you are going into a setting where you could be particularly vulnerable, wearing a mask is always gonna be protective. 
And I think we are going to have to learn the different interventions that we can do to take care of ourselves personally. I think Christine asked the question about, you know, leaving it to the individual patient or person, parent, family. I think their schools are a little bit different because it is a community, it's a community of people. And that's where something to take care of the overall community and keep kids in school, which is ultimately what we want to do. We want to be able to keep kids in school. And that's where decisions need to be made at that level. But going forward, we're going to be looking at things like hospitalizations and case counts to be able to see what the overall burden of this virus is in our community. And otherwise, people are really going to have to take personal responsibility for themselves and for those that they love. Okay, thank you very much. Well, the only thing I'd add to what Manisha said so well is um, on personal responsibility. We've got well over 95% of our teachers are vaccinated. Most of them are boosted. I'd say we have a vast majority of the high schoolers have now been uh, vaccinated, at least with a shot. Uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, kindergarten through eighth grade, we're probably a little over a half. And they've had about 100 days to get vaccinated. Uh, you've got another three weeks. So here's your chance to step up. If you have any concerns at all, uh, here's your chance to step up and make sure your child is vaccinated and safe. The day of New London. Hi, everyone. Uh, Governor, you mentioned mayors and superintendents will be making the call on school masking um, after February 28th. I'm not sure if anyone knows this, but uh, if so, could someone tell me if it's school districts or municipalities who make the decision on whether to mask in schools and or like, does that differ between districts? School districts. School districts would make that decision. And my guess would be, my hope would be that um, superintendents would make that in concert with their local um, public health director. Um, this is a health issue. And I know all through the pandemic for the last two years, um, Superintendents have sought the counsel of their public health director. Thank you. Is that it, Pete? That's it. Let me just follow up on um, Sue Haig's excellent question. Um, we're two years into this thing, and you're not going to get an all clear sign. There's not going to be a day where they say we have zero infection, yippee, we can get back. Um, we, we know from previous experience that uh, there'll be additional ripples as time goes. I think this is the right decision at the right time to give it um, this discretion up to our mayors, up to our superintendents. And more to the point, we now know how to live with this. And I think it's gonna be milder and less impactful. And that means your vaccine and your booster and your mask and those special occasions are gonna be more impactful and able to keep you safe. You've got the discretion to be able to make that choice. And I hope you make the right one. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate you being here.